Um, Go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6. This morning, we're going to be doing uh, a character study. It's a little bit different than what we typically do. Usually, here at Redemption, we go through books of the Bible. Um, And today, we're going to take just a a short break from that uh, and uh, do a character study. We're going to look at the life of Gideon in Judges, chapter 6 through chapter 8. Eight together, and you may be thinking, how in the world is the guy who can't do two verses in an hour going to do three chapters? Uh, so we're going we're gonna to figure it out, all right? Uh, so today we're going to be looking at that. Uh, the book of Judges is in the historical section of Scripture. It's part of the history books. So when you're thinking about the, the genre of literature, that's important when you uh, take it into how you're going to interpret and apply the verses. Because uh, you may read things in the historical section of Scripture that you shouldn't do. Uh, it's telling you what happened, not what should happen. Okay, So it's important for us to grasp that idea. And so as we're looking at this, it's important to know that. And uh, it's titled after the word, the Hebrew word, Shaphat. And we find that word uh, first used in Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, verse 16, we'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Typically, when you think of the word judge, you think of someone sitting at a bench with a gavel pronouncing uh, judgment or deciding the the fates of things. Uh, And that's not a a bad idea of the word judge. This word shafat could mean that. Uh, But it also has the idea of being someone who is a deliverer, someone raised up to deliver somebody else out of something. And that's the concept here. And when we look through judges, you see that the the judges kind of function in both capacities, but primarily as a deliverer. That's the point of the judges. And the whole thing is foreshadowing how Jesus is our deliverer, that we we have an enemy that we need to be delivered from. Our two greatest enemies are sin and death, and Jesus is the only one who could deliver us from them. We were just singing about that before the message, that we were singing about how Jesus conquered sin, conquered death on our behalf. And so as we look at Judges, we need to see not the greatness of these people, but the greatness of our God, foreshadowing and pointing ahead to Jesus. And so the the book of Judges is divided into or centered around these seven cycles. It's something that happens over and over and over again, that, that we, we watch Israel, the nation of Israel, go through these seven cycles. And so I'll tell you what this cycle is. You're going to see this happen because in, in Gideon's life, what we're going to look at is the fourth cycle. It's one of these, these cycles that take place, and you'll clearly see each of these things happen, and that's what we see happen with every, every section here. The cycles are, number one, that God's people sin, that that. that They reject God, they abandon his way, they decide, I want my idol, I want my thing, and God, if you're a good God, you're going to give me my thing. And so they abandon the Lord and they go after their thing, God's people sin. Secondly, not only do we see God's people sin, but we see then God's judgment comes. Because God is good, because God is holy, because God is righteous, he rightly judges sin, that there is something that happens as a consequence to, as a result of their sin. And so uh, the people abandon the Lord, and and through the oppression of their enemies, the nation of Israel is brought into the judgment of God. And then what happens is God's people cry out. The, The weight of sin, the difficulty of it, the pain of discipline drives them back to God. They They finally realize, this isn't working out the way I thought it would. This isn't happening the way I thought it should go. I I thought this was going to be good. I thought this was going to be awesome. And as it turns out, this is terrible. And so the the people cry out to God. They, They begin to ask God, help us, save us, God. And what God does is he raises up a deliverer. So God's deliverer rises. That, that God's grace, God's mercy is poured out upon the people. The deliverer, the judge, rises up, called by God, and delivers God's people from their enemies. We see finally here that God's people repent. They destroy the idols, they return to God, and they live in peace. Through the leadership of the judge, they decide we should let go of these idols, we should go back to God. And then the whole thing starts over again. 
Idolatry comes back. They serve the idols. They abandon God, and the whole thing goes through again. And, and when we look at this, what I hope that you see is not, oh, these poor, dumb Israelites. What you should see is, that's me. This is what I do. If there's a hole, I'm just going to fall in it. I'll, I'll know right where it's at, and I'll still fall in it. Uh, that that's who we are, that, that we have a tendency, a proclivity, uh, uh, an inclination toward what is wrong, toward, is, toward what is not godly, toward what is not good. And so as we see this, we need to be careful to, to see ourselves in the middle of all this cycle. And so Judges chapter 6 verse 1 is the beginning of this fourth cycle, and this is where we find the account of Gideon. So here's our big idea as we look at this together today. We're going to be moving pretty quickly uh, through this in order to cover it all, but but the big idea is this, that God's commandments are God's enablements. That when God tells you to do something, he's going to meet that with the ability as well. You ever heard people say, God's never going to give you something that you can't handle? Yeah, that's not in the Bible. Uh, that's, that's, not a, that's not a biblical concept. God is constantly going to give you things that you can't handle. God is perpetually going to put you in a position of impossibility. And as he does so, what he's doing is he's calling you to trust in him in order to see his provision come through, in order to see what he thinks is, is appropriate and right happen. He's going to call you into things that are sheer, utter impossibility. And as you trust and hope in the Lord, as you put your faith in him, as you rely on him, as you lean upon him, you'll see his ability provide the way through. That, that when God calls us to do this, he's not saying, hey, here's my plan. I want you to figure this out. Here, go, go have a good time doing it. That's not what he's asking us to do. God doesn't, he's not asking for your strength and your ability and your ingenuity. He's asking for your faith and that he'll do it through you. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, the, the big thing with this, and if you want to maybe write this at the top of your notes, is Hebrews 11.34, which is this. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Now, that's the concept that we're looking at. That, that when you look at Hebrews 11, it's called the Hall of Faith. It talks about all these people who did these amazing works of faith for God. And, and the commentary that God has on it in Hebrews 11, 34, is that out of weakness, they were made strong. God did not look at them and say, you're so strong and so awesome, I need you on my team. He looked at them and saw their weakness and his ability to provide through all that weakness. So number one, the first thing we're going to be looking at today is that Israel is in rebellion, following our cycle, Judges chapter 6, verse, verses 1 through 10. Look at verse 1. It says this, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Here Israel has rejected God. They've abandoned his way. They've gone after their idols. See that there, right there in verse 1? They again did evil in the sight of the Lord. As an aside, evil is always in the sight of the Lord. God is the one who determines good and evil. We don't get to determine that on our own. It's not this, it's not this thing where we get to, to decide what is good and what is evil. God does. The reason things are bad is because they are inconsistent with his character and nature. Not because God flipped a coin and decided, oh, murder is bad. No, murder is bad because it's inconsistent with who God is. Okay, so, so when we look at evil, it's always in the sight of God. It's always from his perspective. Good is always in line with who he is. And so the people of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. They started to serve uh, the, the idols of the land. And because of this, what we see happening is that uh, they are um, abandoning the Lord. You see, they've been enticed into believing a lie. That their way is better than God's way. That, that God, you, you just, you kind of, you didn't really get the memo. You know, we're progressive now. We figured some stuff out, like that's old and archaic. Uh, the, the way life should be lived is this way now. Don't, what, you should just accept this stuff because we've come so far and realized we're so awesome. Uh, your way is just too restrictive, God. You're not open-minded enough. This is, doesn't that sound like our world today? It's exactly the way that they're thinking. God, you just need to, you just need to accept our stuff. It reads very much like a commentary on our culture today. And what this resulted in, look at verse 1, is seven years of intense judgment and oppression. Their choosing their way results in seven years of oppression 
and judgment. They, they live in fear. They're in caves. They have no food. Uh, they are uh, in great poverty as you continue to read through this little piece right here. That, that what happens is the, the people of, of the east, uh, Midian uh, and the Amalekites, they are given literally free, literal free range over all of Israel. They're from the east. They come across the Jordan. They go all the way to the west as far as Gaza, uh, which is on the opposite side on the western seaboard there. And, and they're just going anywhere and everywhere they want. They they take all the food, all the livestock. They're left in complete, complete desolation. And so they're so afraid that they literally are going up into the mountains and hiding in caves in the rocks because they're just afraid for their lives. And they've lived like this for seven years. Why did it take them so long? Why does it take us so long to realize this is bad? Why do we want to sit in our depravity for so long? I think it's because we, we think that something's wrong with God. That's, that we're going to outweigh him somehow. You know, God, you're, just, you're going to come around. You'll figure out that what I want is really actually good. And you're, just, you're eventually going to come to my, turn, my side. And you're going to, we're going to reach this turn. Maybe we'll just kind of meet halfway. And God says, no, I don't play that game. You can sit in your pain and your difficulty and your trial for as long as it takes. And it takes them seven years years before they finally say, you know what, maybe we should cry out to God and ask for his help. Uh, it's kind of insane the way this works. Be, this, this is really what it comes down to, that, that when, when people see the scriptures, a lot of times when, you, when people read the Bible, they read where God says don't, and they think, God, what a jerk. Like, why are you taking away the fun stuff? You know, that's what people read when they, when they read the Bible. You're taking away all the fun stuff, all the stuff I want to do, you're saying no. And all the stuff I don't want to do, you're saying I have to do that. And I just, like, why would I want to do this? And we're reading it completely wrong. Because we've got to see it as, when God says don't, he's saying don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. I, when I think about this, and I, I've told you guys this uh, story before, but I think about when my oldest was 18 months old. She's this little little bundle of, of sinful joy. Um, and so, you know, we had good days and really bad days because she's 18, uh, 18 months old. And so as any good dad, uh, I want to disciple my daughter well. And so I feed her steak, right? Praise the Lord. That's what we do. We feed her steak. And so she's sitting on my lap and I cut some pieces of steak, small enough for her to manage because she's little. She's you know, got some chompers, some teeth, and so she can do it. Uh, but I cut little pieces and I put it in her mouth and she's just loving this. And to, the, to this day, she wants her steak medium. She says, don't damage it, God, Dad. Make sure you make it. Give me the pink meat. You know, don't, don't ruin the, the steak. And so she loves it. You know? uh, she loves that, that uh, meat. And, and we've told our kids ever since they were little, when you're eating meat, you're eating animals. You're eating a cow. You're eating a pig. You're, we're not like, it's not a package thing that you get from the store. It's neat and clean. And, you know, no, no, no. It's an animal. Uh, you're eating an animal. And so that way they know and they're not freaked out when they get older. Chicken's chicken? Oh, no. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, so I'm feeding her steak. And as I'm feeding her steak, um, she decides she wants the knife. So like any good dad, I just hand her the knife. Right? No, of course I didn't do that. You guys are like, no. You're going to call CPS. She's 12 now, okay? She can handle her own knife. Um, but she's... If I did that, if I hand her the knife, it's going to be dangerous for her and me. This, there's nothing good that could come out of giving an 18-month-old a knife, a steak knife. You know, she's just going to end up like this, you know, and it's just going to be really bad for everyone. And so she is freaking out, thinking I'm absolutely evil, that I've lost my mind because why would I be so mean and so evil and so heinous as to not give her something like this, this, this knife, which is obviously good. How could I do that? Because as a good dad, I know that there are some things in her life that I cannot give her yet. Today, it's beneficial. Then, it was absolutely deadly. There are some things in life that God withholds from you, not because he's bad, but because you need to get to a certain point of maturity before you can handle it. There are other things in my daughter's life that I will never give her access to. I will always say no to this. No, you cannot drink bleach, honey. I know it looks good, but you'll die, right? This is bad for you. It's not going to go good in any way. You can think you want it all day long. You can say it's right and appropriate, but it's actually deadly poison. As a good dad, I'm going to withhold things from her because when I say no, when I say don't, it's not because I'm rest restrictive and just want to control her life. It's because I want what's best for her. And so too it is with the Lord. 
There's a deception in thinking that we know better. James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says this. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Do you believe that? Do you believe that what God gives you is good, that, that everything good in your life is a gift from him? We've got we've to trust in that, lean on that. Not just, not just shake our heads in agreement and say, yes, the Bible's true, but actually put my faith in that. God, you are good. You take care of your, your children. I can trust you. If you say no, even if I disagree, I'm going to trust you. You're smarter than me, God. I'm going to trust in your way above mine. And if you want to tell me why or you want to explain it, then Lord, I'd love to be able to. But if you choose not to, I'll still trust you. I'll still hope in you. And so giving in to deception, we pursue bondage, but we think it's freedom. We tie ourselves up, we lock ourselves in prison, and we think, I'm free. But in truth, we've made ourselves enslaved because sin always fails to deliver. The cost is always too high. And it always takes away what you hope to get from it. It's never worth it. It's never worth it. It's always too much. And so the people finally find themselves in a position where they're willing to cry out. Look at verse, uh, verse 7. Uh, skip down a little bit. It says this, verse 7. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of those who oppressed you and drove them out before, uh, out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites or those in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So the people cry out for a deliverer. They finally get fed up with this pain and this difficulty, and they say, maybe we could change our situation if we actually went to the Lord. And so they do so, and they cry out for deliverance. But instead of God raising up the deliverer, notice what he gave them. A prophet. They wanted to get out of their situation, but God didn't want to do that. God wanted to do something else first. They wanted a deliverer. He gave them a prophet. He gave them a prophet with a message of repentance. This is because your greatest need is not to be rescued from your circumstance. It's to repent from your idolatry. That's your greatest need. And if you have any doubt in your mind that you, you uh, have idols in your life, then you need to revisit your life a little bit because the human heart is an idol factory. You may not have a, a golden image that you bow down before in your house, but maybe that car is your idol. Maybe that house is your idol. Maybe that spouse or that potential relationship is your idol. Maybe those children are your idol. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but there's something in your life that gathers your affection, that pulls you away from the things of the Lord, and it takes place. It takes precedence. It takes His position. We, we are idolatrous as people. That's our default. We have a tendency to go away from the Lord. And your greatest need is not to be rescued from your circumstance. It's to know where you are not in line with Scripture and to repent. That we need to know Scripture. We need to choose to repent. And then deliverance comes. Do you see that? See how the prophet comes and he reminds them of the things that God did? He, he's, he's recounting Exodus for us. And helping us to see Exodus and Joshua and recounting the history of Israel and saying, look at what your God has done for you. Trust in Him. You see, the right time to repent is right now. Right now. As soon as you notice that sin is in your life, as soon as you notice that idolatry is there, don't wait seven years. Don't sit in that position of, 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 uh, uh, of destruction and of, of receiving the, di the discipline of the Lord. Instead, abandon it now and pursue the Lord. Secondly, not only do we see that uh, Israel's in sin, but now we see that God calls Gideon. In the middle of this, this turmoil and this chaos and this problem and this depravity, God inserts himself and intervenes. Look at verse 11. It says this, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which uh, belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Here we see that God intervenes in the situation when the, the, when the people turn to him. They, they finally turn back to the Lord and he intervenes in the situation. And so God brings himself into the situation. And what we see here, it says in verse 11, the angel of the Lord, see that there? Sometimes when you read that, what that is is a literal angel from God. Sometimes when you read that, it's God himself, a pre-incarnate uh, um, uh, showing of Jesus himself. It's what uh, the- theologically it would be called a Christophany or a theophany. This is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. You see this happen quite a few times that uh, Jesus shows up this way uh, throughout the Old Testament. And in the middle of this, um, Jesus is here, and the way that you know that it's, a, it's not an angel, but it's actually the Lord, is by what it does. Um, when, when this angel of the Lord receives worship, it's, it's the Lord, it's God himself. When, it, when the angel says, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger, it's an angel. It's pretty simple and easy to, to figure out when you see it there. Just look at the context, it'll tell you what's going on with that. And so in this, what we see here is that, uh, that Gideon is doing something really really specific. Notice what it said there, that he is, uh, he's, uh, let's see, verse 11, he, Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Okay, so, so here's what's going on. Uh, the Midianites would come through, like we said, they would destroy and decimate everything. There was no food left, and so Gideon was able to get his crop in a little bit more quickly ahead of the Midianites coming in and destroying everything. And so he takes it all, and he says, I need to thresh this wheat. What that means is you take the wheat, and you have to crush the kernel, and that separates the inside from the chaff, the outside, okay? The chaff, the outside is useless. There's nothing that you can do with it. The inside is what you actually eat. You use that to make bread uh, and lots of, uh, of awesome things that are fluffy and warm and delicious. And so he, uh, he takes this and he's, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what he's doing when he's threshing this wheat. Now notice where he's doing this. It's in a wine press. Okay, a wine press is an enclosed uh, uh, area, usually low, uh, whereby you would put grapes in and you would stamp them out and that's how you would, that's part of the process of making wine. Well, he takes his wheat in there to hide it from the Midianites because these people are thieves and just destroy stuff. And so he's trying to thresh wheat in there. Now, now God comes and he, he meets him in here and that Gideon, when we see this, it's clear that he's hiding because you don't thresh wheat there. You thresh wheat on a hilltop where there's wind. And the way it works is you take a blanket, you put it all in there, you throw it up, the wind blows, the chaff blows away, the wheat falls back down, and there you go. You've just separated it. Pretty, pretty basic kind of a thing, a simple kind of a concept. And he's inside trying to figure this out, separating this. I'm sure this is frustrating and really terrible for the guy. And so Gideon is chosen in the middle of all of this. What's clear here, and we're even told, it says that he's hiding it from the Midianites, that Gideon's hiding. Now, when God shows up and when God selects Gideon, he's not saying, you know what? You've got some amazing covert farming skills. I need you. (laughs) Right? No, that's not it at all. That's not why God chose him. But we're, we're shown here that he is hiding and he is pulling himself away. And notice what God calls him. He calls him in verse 12 at the, at the very end, you mighty man of valor. Does anybody see a, a mighty man of valor here so far? I, I, I don't. As you read through this, this story and as we look at what's happening with Gideon, what we're going to see is that the, the thing that identifies Gideon for the most part is not valor, but it's cowardice. That's who Gideon is. He's filled with, with cowardice. He's unstable, unstable. He's filled with weakness and doubt. And he's wavering and uncertain. He's anything but a mighty man of valor. And yet God shows up before Gideon does anything, while he's hiding, and he says, I'm with you, you mighty man of valor. It's kind of interesting. You see, God saw who Gideon could be and who Gideon would be with him. And when God looks at your life, you may look at all your weakness, all your failure, all your inability, but when God looks at your life, he sees what he can do with it. He sees his great ability to accomplish what you never could dream, what you never could imagine, stuff you would never take on on your own. 
that God alone is the one who can accomplish these things. And he says, he, he says to Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Not because he was, but because he would be. Because that's who God was going to make him to be. You see, God's calling is simultaneously a promise of transformation. Because left to himself, Gideon would remain as a doubting coward. That's all he would be. Unless God intervenes, unless God shows up, unless God changes something, Gideon stays there. And so God inserts himself into Gideon's life, pulls him out of this, and changes him. God's calling for Gideon's life is also a promise of, cha- of transformation for him. Not a better version of Gideon, but a completely changed version of Gideon. You don't need to be a better you. You don't need to be a better version of you. You need to do what uh, John said in John 3.30, I must decrease... That he, might, that he might increase. That Galatians 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That it's not that God comes in and kind of fixes some stuff. No, he tears down the old building and builds up something totally different. That's what we need from the Lord. That kind of transformative, miraculous, all-inclusive power of God. And so in verses 13 through 15, what we see is that Gideon blasphemously questions God. He questions God's character, attacking the prophet's message of chapter uh, of verses 8 through 10, saying, well, we, if you did it then and our parents talk about the, all this cool stuff, why are you letting us be destroyed by Midian now? Not realizing the, the problem was your sin, Gideon. It wasn't God's abandoning you. It's that you've chosen to suffer. Choose sin, choose to suffer. And so they blame God. But in all of this, he wasn't questioning God's ability. He was was questioning God's goodness. I know you can, God, but you're not. So something's wrong with you. You're not helping us the way I thought you should. And so verse 16, look at what it says there. It says, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. He's calling Gideon to trust and hope in God and not himself. I know it looks impossible to you, Gideon. I know you look at this and you think this is insane. We're, we're told in, in the beginning of this chapter that the, the, the people of Midian in the east, they were uh, numerous as locusts. That they're, they were, that's a, a euphemism to say that there's just so many of them, we couldn't number them. That there's this massive army. And it's, 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 a, uh, um, it's likened to the idea of sand on the beach, all the number of people that are there. And so Gideon looks at this and he says, you're going to call me, the guy hiding in the wine press, and I'm going to defeat them? You're nuts. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. God mercifully ignores Gideon's blasphemy and promises his presence. That's crazy to me. Gideon blasphemously accuses God, and God just ignores that, moves on, and says, you're going to do this. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be the one who produces the, your ability and your victory. You see, God being with you is the crux of all Christian service. Everything that you could do for the Lord is is centered upon, is reliant upon the Lord being with you. That if God's not with you, then you just go through the motions of doing some stuff for the sake of doing some stuff. That's where burnout comes from. That's where frustration comes from. That's where anxiety and pressures and weird decisions that are made out of character and abandoning the way of God come from. They come from not abiding in the presence of God, not following his direction. It comes from stepping out and saying, God, bless my thing, instead of waiting for the Lord to say move and then going and doing his thing. Gideon is not seen in any way pressing God and saying, you need to raise me up as an awesome leader for Israel. He's the one responding to God and God's call for his life. Gideon was called to faith in God and God's plan and God's ability, not to strategize and think to his own strength and ability. He was called to God's plan and God's ability. We see next that Gideon has to be grown in verses 17 through 40. Look at verse 17 says this, Then he said to him, Gideon said to God, Now, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who walk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. And so uh, Gideon here, now that his calling is established, he must be developed. He's got to be, his faith has to be grown and developed in order for him to 
<clears throat> actually do what God's calling him to do. And so Gideon, here, he rightly seeks to ensure that his faith is actually placed in God. That it's not, it's not uh, the, the Bible tells us that Satan can appear as an angel of light and he can deceive. Uh, it's not just some figment of his imagination. Maybe, you know, Gideon bumped his head and, you know, had a weird vision and maybe that's what's going on. And so he wants to make sure I'm really actually interacting with a messenger from God that I'm being called of the Lord to do this. Now in this, what we, what we see is that the Old Testament appearance of God seemed to be a man. That, that when you look at the way God shows up in all of these situations, it always looks like he's just some guy. That, that here with Gideon, we see that. It looks like a guy. Uh, also, we see with Abraham that when God and a couple of his angels came, they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, that it says that a man came. And that uh, Abraham prepared food for them. And then Jacob, when he wrestled the angel, it appears as a, a man. That the Lord appeared to be a man. That Joshua, when he was considering taking out Jericho, that, we're, that uh, he's wandering through, uh, just kind of thinking about this whole idea. And then he comes across a man with a sword drawn. And Gideon interacts, or Gideon, Joshua interacts with him like a man. He says, who are you for? Not realizing it's God himself. In this, God shows himself, and when he appears, it looks as though he's just a man. And so Gideon asks this man to prove his authority, to prove his deity. Who are you really? And so let me bring something to you. And so God reveals himself through doing a, a couple of different things. That what we see is that Gideon says, let me bring an offering to you. So he goes and he gets a, a, a goat. He uh, boils it. He brings the meat. He brings some bread. He takes the broth that he boiled it in and he brings it in a basket and in a bowl and he brings it out and he says, here, here, this is for you. And so what we see happen is that the Lord says, okay, put it on that rock. And so he takes the meat and the bread in the basket, puts it on the rock. He says, okay, now pour out the broth. So he pours out the broth next to it. And it says that God then takes the staff that's in his hand. He touches the rock. And as soon as he does, fire comes out of the rock, consumes the bread, consumes the meat, and he's gone. And Gideon freaks out. Oh no, I was in the presence of God. And he remembers back to Exodus when, when Moses said, God, show me, your, show me your presence. Show me, let me be where you are. Let me see you. And God said, I can't because if I reveal myself to you, you'll die. And Gideon goes, I've seen God. I'm going to die. And God has to speak to him and calm him down and say, no, bro, if I was going to kill you, it'd already be done. Like, we're, you're good. <laughs> we're gonna, I want to use you, not kill you. Okay? And so what we see happening here is that uh, God reveals himself through receiving the worship in verse 20. It says, the angel of God said to him, take the meat and unleavened bread. So he receives the worship. He miraculously accepts the sacrifice through the fire and he miraculously disappears. God reveals himself to Gideon this way. Gideon clearly that he had been, he believed that he had been with God. He does something that's really important for us. Something that you and I need to do as well. First John chapter four, verse one, we'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is, this is right. This is appropriate for Gideon to do. This isn't any sort of doubt or wavering faith on Gideon's part in, in any way. He's making sure that I am actually in God's presence, that I'm actually dealing with a messenger from the Lord. And so he does so, and God reveals himself in this miraculous way. Well, verse 25, we see it says, Now it came to pass in the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal, or Baal, whatever way you want to say it, that is, uh, that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord, your God, on top of this, of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bowl and offer it as a sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men from his, among his servants and did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night." So here we see that God calls him into something else. God is growing his faith. He's pulling him out of his cowardice into this mighty man of valor. And that night God commands Gideon with the first steps of obedience. That, that if God is to use us, we cannot remain as we are. We can't remain in our sin. We can't remain in our rebellion. Our idolatry has to be dealt with in order for us to be used by God. But that's what has to take place 
first. And so before he can move forward with him, before anything else can take place in Gideon's life, before he can exercise any kind of leadership or help anybody else, God's got to deal with his idolatry first. And so he goes to him and he says, here's what we're going to do. I want you to take this altar. I want you to tear it down. I want you to, to build an altar before me. And I want you to offer a sacrifice on that altar. And so the, the, the perpetual state of the Christian life is like we said before, that I decrease and you increase. And this is what God's calling him into. You've got to decrease and I've got to increase in your life. And so we see here that he does something really interesting. That, that when he calls Gideon to do this, there's four things that take place in terms of how this transformation or how this change comes about in Gideon's life. The first thing that God does is he calls Gideon to recognize his idolatry as sin. Hey, hey Gideon, this is wrong. You've got to start there. If you're not willing to recognize your idolatry as sin, if you're not willing to call it what God calls it, if you're going to use an excuse or use some sort of reason why it's okay or just rename it, then you're always going to be enslaved to it. You've got to recognize it as what God recognizes it as. That it's sinful. You've got to recognize your sin for what it is. The idol is sin. Secondly, you've got to be willing not to just call it what God calls it. You've got to repent. Right? Isn't it... Isn't it uh, possible for us to recognize something is wrong and just stay in it anyway? Isn't, isn't that possible? Do you do that? Am I the only one that does that? Um, yeah, we can recognize it as sin. We can recognize it as idolatry and just say, well, it's not that bad. No, you've got to repent. You've got to turn away from it. You've got to abandon that and turn to the Lord. Now, repentance is not turning from one sinful thing to another. It's not turning from your, uh, your sin to somebody or to some self-help or some program. It's turning to the Lord. It's turning to God. That's who delivers you. It's not, your, not yourself, not somebody else, not another sin. It's, it's to the Lord that you abandon that to pursue the Lord. Thirdly, not only do you recognize your sin as sin, you repent from that, but you've got to then remove the sin. He tells him, Gideon, tear down the altar. Burn it up. Don't leave it there in case you want to go back later. Because you will. Right? You're going to go back. So don't leave it. Don't leave an access to it. Don't leave a road to it. Tear it down. Burn it up. It needs to be all gone. Remove it from your life. Take whatever drastic measures you need to take to cut that thing out. Make sure it doesn't have opportunity to come back. Fourthly, and finally, you've got to replace that idolatry with worship to God. If you go this far, if you go so far as to say it's sinful, to repent of it, to even burn it up and say it's all gone, but you don't replace it with worship to God, you will find yourself right back in that same position. You've got to replace that thing that you've removed with an attitude and a position of worship before the Lord. And so he says, burn it up, but I want you to offer a sacrifice on that before me, Gideon. Worship me in the place of that idolatry. You see, if Gideon can't do this, he'll never lead the people. He'll never be able to move forward. If I am to lead, then I've got to go first, right? Isn't that kind of like a definition of leadership? You go first. And men, I want to challenge you with this. I want to challenge you with leading your home, with leading your church, with leading your family, with leading in your workplace, that you lead like this. Has your, has your wife or your kids, have they ever seen you repent? Have they ever seen you call your sin what it is? They know you're sinning. If you're not sure where your sin is, just ask them. They'll tell you. They know right where it's at. But if your pride and your arrogance holds you captive to not even be willing to repent before them, how will you ever do anything of honor before the Lord? How will you ever glorify Him? You're so wrapped up with yourself that you'll never move past this. It'll always keep you enslaved. This is strength. Not pridefully and arrogantly saying, I have no problems. Bro, you're jacked if you think that. You got big problems. And we've got to be a people of repentance. Gideon did it verse 27, that night, uh, but he was afraid. See that? He was afraid. He was afraid, but he was obedient. You get that? You see that there? 
He didn't want to do it during the day because he was freaked out. He didn't know how this was going to go. And so he did it, but he did it at night because he was afraid. But he did it. And sometimes you just got to do it scared. It's, it's not going to just be, it's not all going to work out. You're not going to feel this peace about it all the time. You're not just going to go, everything's going to be good. Sometimes you just, you got to be scared and just do it anyway. God told me to do it. God called me to jump into this. I've got to do it scared. I'm going to, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm freaked out, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so this is what Gideon does. You see, when fear keeps you from obedience, that's sin. James 4, 17 says, if you know to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. There's sins of commission where you do something wrong, but there's also sins of omission, that you know it's right and you don't do it. You choose to omit the things that you should do. And so Gideon does what is right and appropriate. And so then these guys come and they say, hey, who tore this down and what's going on? And we're going to kill that guy. And so Gideon's dad stands up for him and says, hey, if, uh, if, this, if this God is actually a God, then let him deal with my son. I mean, don't, you, have to, you have to stand up for your God, then it's not really a God, right, is basically what he says. And so Gideon, uh, his life is spared in the middle of all that because his dad stands up for him. And so Gideon is, is doing this. And then, and then at the end of this, it's, we're told that the Spirit of God comes upon Gideon. He blows a trumpet or something. I don't know what he did. And so then uh, he blows a trumpet and he says, everyone gather around me. We're going to go take out Midian. And to his surprise, his whole city does so. I'm sure that's mind-blowing to him. Like, someone came. So then he sends out messengers to the surrounding uh, uh, region here and all the different tribes, and they all show up too. God is moving. God's hand is miraculously moving, and people are coming and rallying around him by faith. And I'm sure this is mind-blowing to Gideon. He thought, for sure, I'm going to be the only guy, and I'm just going to die. I'm, I'm going to obey you, Lord, but it's, I'm going to die. That's just how this is going to go. And so he calls out to them. And so then Gideon starts to have doubts. In verses 36 through 40, what we see is that Gideon has doubts. And this is the most, this is the most common place uh, uh, of Scripture that we know about when we think about Gideon's life. It's the fleeces, right? Like Gideon lays out a fleece and says, God, make it wet. Uh, and then he, says, he does it again the next night and says, okay, make the ground wet. So what Gideon does here is he's laying out these fleeces in order to ascertain God's will, God's direction. Um, he's got an army by the Spirit of the Lord. Yesterday he was a coward. Now he's a general. Like, how, this is crazy for him. And now here he is, not sure what to do. And this, in this, as he's doing this, what he's saying is, okay, God, I, I want to make sure that I'm doing what you said. And so I'm going to put out a fleece, and I want you to make the fleece wet, but the ground all around it dry. And he goes to bed and he wakes up the next morning and it happened. He t picks up the fleece, he wrings out a, an entire bowl full of water. And he's like, yes, this is amazing. Okay, God, don't be mad at me, but let's flip that. Make the ground wet and the fleece dry and then I'll really know it's you. And so he goes to sleep, wakes up the next day and it happens. This is crazy. And so Gideon's like, okay, God, I guess you're telling me to do this. I'm going to move forward. I, I, I'll do this. Now, when we read this, what I want to submit to you is that this is not a good way for Christians to discern the voice of God. Okay? This is, this is you know, like rolling dice and, you know, pick up sticks or whatever you want to do. Like, this is not how you determine God's voice. This is not how you determine God's will. Even in Gideon's life, can you see how God miraculously called him, miraculously revealed himself, miraculously brought an army, and now Gideon's wavering? This is not an act of faith on Gideon's part. This is Gideon slipping back into the road of cowardice. This is Gideon slipping back into faith. There's a lot of Christians, I, I hear them say, I just want to put out a fleece before the Lord. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. Don't put out fleeces before God. That's not, this is not written for us to say, oh, let's do what Gideon did. This is written for us to see God has been with Gideon all the way through, and the guy's going right back to his cowardice, right back to his lack of faith. It's showing us the ruts in our lives, not something to, to do because that's what Gideon did. It's not a noble attempt in order to ascertain the validity of God's word by miraculous confirmation. It's cowardice. It's doubt. It's fear. God's already clearly spoken, already clearly revealed himself, already proven himself, already brought all the guys necessary. Gideon's just wavering in his faith. So we come to chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the, uh, the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. Verse 2, And the Lord said to Gideon, 
The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel claim the glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Gideon here in verses uh, 1 through 7 of chapter 7, it's Gideon being equipped. God's equipping Gideon for the battle. Now, God's equipping looks very much the opposite of what we would think it was. That God's equipping of Gideon is actually taking away, not giving to. And in this, God's concerned, did you see that in verse 2? God's concerned is that the people are going to claim the victory is theirs. They're going to think, we did this. Well, look how strong we are. I thought we were weak, but we're actually strong. And, and God's concerned that they're going to think that the victory is theirs. Now, Midian's army uh, is, as you look ahead in chapter 8, what we see is that uh, in verse 10, that Midian's army is about 135,000, okay? That's more than a couple. So they got a 135,000 man army. And Israel's army at this point, we're told, is 32,000. Okay, so those odds right there, if you just take it as it is, 32,000 against 135,000, that's about four to one. Now, I can't take out four guys. Like, maybe you're a stud and you could do it. But me, like, I think I'm going to have a hard time with one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Uh, I'm a better preacher than a puncher. And uh, so, like, maybe we're going to have some issue with this. So they got four to one odds and God says, no, you guys, you're going to be tempted to think you had something to do with this. Okay, Gideon, we need, to, we need to reduce the army. So he says, Gideon, go to everybody and tell them, hey, if you're afraid, go ahead and go home. And 22,000 leave. He only's got, he's only got 32,000. 20, two-thirds go home. Why did these guys show up in the first place? Like, what? they just came. I'll tell you, I'll, I, here's what I think. I, I, I can't tell you biblically, but here's what I think. Because they're guys. Guys are just competitive. You know, it's like, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to be the one sitting at home. You're going to go, I, I'm going to go too. So I'm, I'm coming. I'm tough. I got this. I'm in. We're going to do this. And so, and especially with brother, I hear that brothers are really competitive. I wouldn't know. I grew up with my mom and sister and now I got four daughters. And so I hear guys compete. I, I don't know, whatever. So they're, they're in the middle of all this and these guys all come and then they, they just leave. It's probably peer pressure. It's probably this competition thing, but they all decide, all right, I'm freaked out. I'm out. See ya. 10,000 are left. Okay. Now with 10,000 left, we see that uh, God says, nope, there's still too many. And with 10,000 left, the odds are 13 and a half to one. And God says, no, no, no you guys are still going to think it had to do with you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do, Gideon. Go down to the water, have them drink. Notice what it says in uh, verse, let's see, verse, still too many. Okay, verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to him, Gideon, everyone who laps from the, uh, who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps. Have you ever drank water that way? I don't know that I've ever done that. Apparently someone's going to do it. Um, Set those guys apart by themselves. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300. And all the rest uh, of the people got down to drink on their, uh, on their knees. Verse 7, Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Notice there in verse 7, God says, I will save you. So God reduces this, this army that was already outmatched down to 300, which is 450 Midianites to every one Israeli. Okay, so this is, this is impossible, right? Can we agree that this is not going to happen? I don't care how awesome they are, if it's some sort of crazy Jackie Chan movie or something, they're still not going to take out 450 guys apiece. Like, this, is, this is crazy. This is not going to happen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on in their minds at this point, but I'm sure they're pretty freaked out. The, God sends away this, these 9,700 and only keeps 300. This is because the odds of sheer impossibility, hear this, hear this. This is the point of Gideon. The odds of sheer impossibility are God's choice environment for working. That's where God chooses to work. That's where God shows up. That's where God comes through. God leads us into these places over and over again of just sheer impossibility. There's no way out of this. There's no way to make this work. God, I can't figure it out. I don't have enough strength. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough stuff. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough resource. 
I'm, I'm left with nothing, Lord. Unless you come through, I'm doomed. That's where he brought them. That's where he brings us. That's God's choice environment for working. Because in those moments, it's clear that he gets the victory. And it had nothing to do with me. So God here in verse 7 emphasizes that it's his presence that's going to produce the victory. Not their cunning, not their ingenuity, not their craftiness, not their brute strength, not their sheer numbers. They were in trouble as a result of their own sinfulness. And it was their disobedience that brought them into this bondage. And it's only obedience that's going to produce the victory that they need. And so I want to ask you just, just very clearly, what is your impossible situation? What's the thing God's leading you to? What's the thing that you've, you feel stuck in that there's no way out of? Even if you put yourself there through your disobedience, God will still deliver you. He will still come through. It may not look like the deliverance you think it should look like. It may not come out the way that you think it's supposed to come out, but he's still going to be there for you. He's still going to lead you through it. Obedience is where we need to go. Obedience is the direction we take. Verses 8 through uh, chapter 8, verse 21, what we see here is that Gideon is victorious. There's a, a huge section here that talks about how Gideon took them out and, and how he came through and, and got this victory. And what we see here is in verse 9, it says, It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, that I've delivered, uh, for I've delivered it into your hand. And so now God, this third miraculous time, speaks to Gideon, interacts with him, and God uh, has told Gideon what to do all the way through this, step by step. That God, uh, God did, did, did not um, abandon Gideon in the process. He didn't leave him to figure it out on his own. But God, step by step, led him through. It was Gideon's obedience to this step that unveiled the next step. Sometimes we want step three before we'll take step one, and that's not how God works. He just doesn't do that. He says, take this step of obedience first, and then I'll tell you what's next. But you've got to take that first step of faith and obedience first as he directs and leads your path. Gideon here was not left to, to, to do whatever he wanted. He wasn't blindly jumping into, uh, into action in his own time or his own way to try to make God's call happen. He waited for God's call. He waited for God's direction. And that's how he produced the victory moving forward. A lot of times we see what God wants us to do. We see the God gives us a little bit of a vision down the road. Hey, I want to do this. I want to accomplish this. And then we say, all right, thanks God for telling me. I got it from here. And we try to just go off and make it happen on our own. And what we need to do is realize, no, God's going to give you the next step to take. Even if you can see down the road a little ways, he's going to give you that next step to take. He's going to leave it vague enough out there to where you have no idea how you're going to get there. And he's going to tell you to take this step. I remember when I was, um, I just graduated from uh, high school and uh, I'd, I'd known on, that I was called into ministry. Uh, the same day I got saved, uh, God called me into ministry. And so I thought, hey, I've, I've never read the Bible. And I guess pastors talk, so I should learn how to do that. Um, my whole goal in life was going under the radar, not talking to anybody. I didn't want anyone to know my name or uh, look at me for anything. And so that was my purpose in high school. That was what I, and I was pretty good at that. Uh, and so then I, then I'm called into this ministry thing. I've I got saved when I was 17, so I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I never read the Bible. I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't want to talk in front of anybody. And so I thought, hey, I should go to community college. I'll take a public speaking class, right? Because you got to talk, so I'll learn how to do that. And so they teach you things like look at people, move your hands, use inflection, those kinds of things. And so I'm like, awesome, yeah, I'll learn all this cool stuff. And there happened to be a couple of really cute chicks in the class, and I really wanted to impress them and think that was awesome. And so I'm like really excited to talk in front of them and make them think I was great, and I, I did terrible. It was horrible. It was a massive, huge, I failed the class. It was bad. It was really, really bad. I tried to do in my flesh what God was calling me to do. I, I thought, God, you, you've called me to it. You told me to do it. I've got to figure out what to do now and make it happen. And, and in doing that, I caused more problem. I got in the way of the Lord. I, didn't, I wasn't helping him in any way. And so God calls Gideon to do this. And even though he calls him to do this and says, get up and go, he's still fearful. And so God says, okay, if you're still afraid, go down by the camp of the Midianites and here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll tell you what you're going to do next. And so he goes down, he takes one of his servants with him. And, uh, and as they sit around the, the outskirts of the camp, it's dark. They hear a couple of the Midianites talking. And one guy says to his friend, man, you'll never believe the dream I just had. It was really weird. 
I saw a loaf of bread tumble into the camp and it knocked over a tent. And the other guy goes, no way, Gideon's going to kill us. Like, I don't know how he made that connection, <laughs> but he did, <laughs> right? And Gideon just happened to be in earshot far enough away to hear what was going on. And that just invigorated him with faith. He knew that was the Lord. God was speaking to him through them. And, and this, 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 this position that he was in, finally, his fear was overcome with faith. And he goes back to the guys and he says, let's go to war, boys. Let's take this, these guys on. And so verse 15, we read that it says, uh, and so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation that he worshiped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, 100 in each company, right? And he put a trumpet into every man's hand and empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I, uh, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and Gideon. So here's his battle plan. I got 300 guys. I'm going to divide them up. You guys go over there. You guys go over here. We're going to stay here. And then you guys are going to do what I do. Here, here's your implementation of war. You have a trumpet and a pitcher with a torch inside. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to walk up, and then I'm going to break my pot, and I'm going to blow my trumpet, and then you guys are going to do the same thing. All right? And so they all do. They get up there, and he breaks it, and you go, you know, the sword of the Lord and Gideon! And that's it. Like, that's the plan. I don't know if those 300 guys were like, bro, I, I think we should go home too. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work out the way you think it's going to. And so they do. They do this by faith in the Lord. And it says that at that moment, God sent confusion into the camp of Midian, and they all started slaughtering each other. So they just stood there over the, watching this chaos happen and sue. And they're like, this is crazy. And so then he calls everyone else who left. He says, hey, God's delivered them into our hand. They chase them down. They rout the army. They take everybody out. And this crazy victory comes to pass. What we see happening as we, as we look at this is that God caused Midian to be so confused that they killed one another. And, and in this, God's victory was produced by this miraculous means. Now, like we said in the very beginning, that we have two great enemies as well, sin and death. And those enemies are only only defeated by Jesus. We can't defeat them. We need him to miraculously come through for us. And so as this victory is accomplished, it's thorough and it's complete. Go to chapter 8, verse 12, if you would. It says this, um, When Ziba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them and took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. See that? He took everybody out. Now, these two guys, Ziba and Zalmunna, they're like the last two kings or princes that are left. And so Gideon is pursuing them. And as he's pursuing them, he stops at one town. And he says, hey, guys, my, my, guys are, are, uh, my, my men are hungry. Feed them some bread so we can keep chasing down Ziba and Zalmunna. And the guys of the city go, mm, you don't have the bad guys yet. So... I'm not really sure we want to trust you. No. And so Gideon says, okay, well, when we come back, I'm going to tear your flesh with thorns. I'm going to make a whip of thorns and whip you with them. All right. They go to the next town, say the same thing. They get the same response. And so Gideon says, okay, I'm going to tear down your tower when we come back with them. And so they go, they catch Ziba and Zalmunna. They come back with them. They stop at the, the first, the, the second town, which would be the first on the way back. And uh, they, they tear down the tower, kill all the men. Wow. And then they come back to the other town and they, uh, they, they find the guys, they find out who all of the leaders are and Gideon takes them and whips them with thorns and tears their flesh from their body. What in the world is going on? What's happening with all this that, uh, that we see something kind of crazy going on? You see, what happens is that Gideon is overcome with the sin of pride. Now that God's working, now that God's doing all of this crazy stuff that God said he would, even though Gideon was fearful and afraid and filled with cowardice all the way through, now God's moving, and now he is being unmerciful to the very people to, that, that are having the very problem he had. They lacked faith. They were, they were falling into the same problem that he was, and Gideon fails to show the mercy to others that God showed to him. And so he does something crazy. Because in my pride, 
my weakness and sin always looks worse on you. That's why you see that sin in someone else's life so clearly. Did you know that? Because it's yours. And it always looks terrible on them. There's reasons why it's, it's okay for me. Okay, it's not that bad for me because I got these reasons and excuses, but it's terrible for them. And that this is what Gideon's doing. His, his pride is taking over. And Gideon was guilty of worse. It was just the night before that he was so afraid that he needed a crazy, miraculous dream to get him to do anything. And so now here he is taking these guys out and, and overreacting to their lack of faith. Pride produces foolishness, and it, all, it always hurts, and it always hurts others. Lastly, we see that Gideon is foolish as we conclude his life in verses 22 through 32 of chapter 8. Look at verse 22, it says this, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Here in this, we see that Gideon uh, uh, is, is rightly responding to them and saying, I'm not going to set up a dynasty that God is your king, God is your ruler. But even though he starts in humility, he allowed pride and compromise to overtake him in the end. Starting well is easy, finishing well is hard. It's easy to start a race. It's hard to finish it. And so here, as we look at Gideon's life, we come to the end of it, and he finishes poorly. He doesn't continue in faith because he allows pride to settle into his heart. As a result of the victory, people wrongly attribute their success and their newfound freedom to Gideon, and Gideon rightly and honorably points them back to God because he knew he didn't save them. He knew it was God. He is the one who stood on the hill with those 300 guys, and he's watched God's miraculous victory. He knew he had no chance. But while Gideon does this in starting well, he, he doesn't finish well. He refuses the kingship, but he desires the priesthood. Look at verse 24. It says, Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give to me the earrings from his plunger. For they had golden earrings because uh, they were Ish Ishmaelites. Verse 27, Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Ophrah, and Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. You see, Gideon here is able to take all of this victory and say, I don't want to be the king, but I do want to desire the priesthood. He asks them for the earrings, and the people are, are they say, of course. That's not too much. And so they lay out a, a big uh, blanket or carpet or whatever, and everyone walks by and they throw in their earrings. And what we're told is that the weight of these earrings was 1,700 shekels, which is about 45 pounds, okay? About 45 pounds of gold, all right? Now, just so that you know what this would cost, that's about 720 ounces of gold. And if you know anything about the ounces of gold and their cost today, it's about 1,200 bucks an ounce, so he's got a little bit of money, right? He's got a little bit going on here. He's got about $900,000 worth of gold that is just sitting there just by the earrings that they took. That's kind of crazy when you look at that. And so he takes all of this and he makes an ephod in verse 27. Now, Exodus 28 tells us that uh, an ephod is a priestly garment with very specific materials designed to be worn before the Lord. And uh, what Gideon does is he takes it and he duplicates it, but he makes his of pure gold. It's to say, I may not be your king, but you will remember my awesomeness. You'll remember my valor. I'm not, I, I know that I can't be the king because God needs to be your king, but I still want a little, a little taste of the glory, essentially, is what he wants. He wants just a little bit of God's glory, and so he tries to, to take that for himself. And this turns out to be his undoing. You see, Gideon traded one idol for another and he led the people back into the slave, slavery of idolatry that he was raised up to deliver them from. As Gideon dies, what we see is that the people immediately go right back into idolatry. That that's the legacy of Gideon's life. You see, all of this was because of his pride. That he wanted God's glory. And he wouldn't just leave it alone. So I want to close with two things, two major takeaways. As we look at the life of Gideon. Number one is, Jesus does not need your strength. He wants to do something, but he doesn't need you to do it. You get to be a part of it, right? That's the amazing part. He doesn't need your strength. He doesn't need your ability. Because he's called you, he'll sustain it and bring it to pass. Secondly, take care to not allow the victory that he provides to incite your flesh into thinking it has anything to do with you. 
You're going to be tempted to think that. You will be tempted to think that you're awesome and that you have such, such cool abilities and that God is, is so uh, grateful to have you on his team. That's not true. That's, that's the enemy. It's easy to start well, but it's hard to finish well. In John 15, 5, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Believe that. Believe that. In Hebrews eleven thirty four, 34, out of weakness, they were made strong. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Gideon's weakness drove him to the Lord to find his strength. And I want to challenge us to be those kind of people. In my weakness, I'm going to find the strength of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the chance to study it together. We pray that you would help us to honor you with our lives, God, to draw near to you and to bless your name. And we pray that you would help us to uh, start the way Gideon started, in humility, and to finish that way as well. Lord, we love you. We commit to you in your name, Jesus. Amen.